Sandra to, there we go. I want to welcome uh, Chandra to the RSOI and OTAP team. She is new staff with us this year, and she's really helping us get organized. Um, the person that it's my job to, job and pleasure to introduce to you this morning is Kelly Foner. Kelly has been a partner with us in Echo Voices for uh, several years now. She helps us set the, um, the, the topics and identify speakers. And I know you're gonna just enjoy the heck out of work hearing from her and, and the discussions that we will have with her this morning. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hand it to Kelly and welcome Kelly Foner. You need I am muted. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there. Big experience and all. Well, well, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us. And I know that we have some people that'll be watching this recorded um, as well. But as Gail said, we're really looking forward to a year of Echo Voices. These are some of my favorite things to attend um, every month, and I'm really excited about this topic of. Um, of what we're what we're doing with AAC communicators, and we we've had that kind of focus before communication partners, but you know Gail's put a real emphasis on that this year, and and I think please do feel open to share. I've got a second screen up that's also watching chat. Um, I'm a big chat user, so please feel free to use that throughout to ask questions or just raise your hand. We're a small group here, and with the live. Um, group. So just, you know, raise your hand. Gail will be watching out for that because I really, I tend to look at echoes and uh, Gail mentioned the, you know, the, the two that are here in Oregon and then the one in Wyoming. We also, I live in Wisconsin. Um, our university also has an AAC echo that happens once a month. Um, and I've heard that Florida has one, but I haven't been able to, yeah, oh, Gail, I'll have, you'll have to give me the link to that because I have not been successful at finding Florida's uh um echo project but i do find that being able to chat with people and get some information on a topic so you get your pd but then you also get that active part of the learning community so i i just went through to get us started here kind of set your calendar um and there's a nice document that they've you know that you've gotten through email and i just kind of pulled it apart so that you look at what's coming this fall today we're going to talk about the roles of communication partners and just kind of set the stage for all the rest of this great stuff that's happening. If you've not heard Jill and Matthew, they are wonderful. They're the people that have uh, kind of coined the, the phrase s'mores um, as they talk about modeling and, and training communication partners in the home, as, as well as strategies that we can use um, in our schools. Uh, Tana, I'm just getting to learn um, about Tana and her organization, but she has some really great things connecting AAC um, with family life and being able to, how do we keep, you know, that support going for the many families that we support. In my role, um, Gail told you a little bit about what I've done with OTAP. I'm a special education teacher um, I and a consultant. I spend most of my time doing webinars and online consulting, but I also am still a teacher. I have a couple of virtual students who are medically fragile, so they're still at home. Um, so I do a lot of work with coaching parents to be communication partners and one-on-one -on -one health aides and, and all, and I'm working with a, a, a sixth grader who has all general ed teachers as her other teachers. So I'm, getting to teach a science and social studies teacher about universal design for learning because she spent a whole year learning about communication. Now we're we're adding other pieces to what she knows and that's exciting stuff. Um, and I think that if you um, are able to join us for Carolyn and Sarah, where they talk about, you know, that whole world, not just these little bits that we that many of us often spend with the AC users looking throughout that whole day. So the fall lineup is great. The winter lineup is packed. Um, 
I'm excited because I've not heard Carolyn Parker speak. So this and this topic for me, the pushing forward and push in teaching SLPs how to do therapy in the classroom is really a great topic. Heidi, I love what her coaching strategies and many of us are following coaching models and Heidi's right in there do actively doing that um, as a part of her consultation and direct service work. Sarah Weber is another person that's new to me. So I like that. I love this idea of consent in the classroom and, you know, the, kind of what's going on and, and making sure that we're working within guidelines and things. Krista Howard, I've known since she was in high school. So she is fabulous. She is a AAC consultant. She's a mother. She's an AAC communicator. And she is one of the people that really, I mean, if you're trying to work with individuals and in, in building their own self-determination and their own self-advocacy, Krista is certainly a wonderful model for that. Um, and then Barbara and Pam, who both are from assistive wear, but are also connected family-wise to individuals that use AAC, um, are going to expand upon that idea of family and coaching with families and kind of working hand in hand um, with families. And then the spring, Kelly Key is like one of the most dynamic people out there. Um, and so talking about the things that she's doing in her um, school district, her colleague, uh, Deidre, is going to talk about transition strategies. And then, and, and then the foursome there, um, I love the name of this this session that they're doing is the MI muted, fostering effective self-advocacy and AAC users. I think it's just, I've, I've, I have another student that we've worked a lot on. Well, how, what is her self-talk and how does she advocate for herself while she's in virtual school by asking for things like, I need more time, I wanna check and try and, you know, say that slower or all kinds of things that she really gets her point across um, to her general ed teachers. And then Paige is going to talk about executive functioning, you know, one of the buzzwords in assistive technology, but how and how that relates to AAC. And then I didn't put it on here, but we do have a wrap session. So mid -mar mid May. We have a wrap up where I'll be back here with Gail. I'm going to be attending all of these sessions, either live or virtually, and we'll do a wrap on all of them. What are the things that you got from those sessions? I usually do my two takeaways um, and then people add to it. So hopefully you're looking forward to this year as well. And, and we're interested in finding out like, you know, because Gail can also provide some direction to people as they're developing their presentations. So as we go through my presentation, I have definitely spots to ask you questions about and it's things that we can talk about here, but these also might be topics that Gail can share with the presenters this year so that we make sure that we're covering what it is that you all need. And, you know, Kelly, the other thing that happens often um, with some of our Echo Voices sessions is that we find that um, a particular speaker just doesn't have enough time in these short morning sessions. So we often find ways to invite them in to, um, to talk more about their topic, either in a conference or some kind of a, a webinar that we may have already planned or even occasionally something that we do that's brand new. So please do keep in touch with us, let us know um, how this year's Echo Voices is working for you. And we're always um, excited when people want to share their ideas and, and their topics with us. So thank you for saying that. All right. So today's topic to kind of get this year of talking about communication partners is the idea of the many roles that communication partners fulfill. You know, we come in often in certain defined roles, teacher, speech therapist, parent, friend, but we often find that we have other roles that we play 
as we become teacher becomes coach or SLP becomes coach to the teacher. You know, that's kind of all these secondary roles that we play around and supporting um, those who are AAC communicators. There is a, you know, when Gail talked about watching some sessions that maybe you haven't seen, there's several sessions that focus on the communication bill of rights. And I know we have one coming up, but we had a great duo of speakers last year that focused solely on the communication bill of rights as it impact their lives as individuals who are autistic and that used and that use AAC. So that might be one to, to go back and take a look at if the communication bill of rights is something that is new to you. Um, it's, it's a great guiding pillar for many of us. When I think about roles, I'm always thinking about the roles that I play, but I'm also thinking about who are the researchers, who are the people that have talked to us about roles and how that fits into the, the world of a, an AAC communicator. And Sarah Blackstone and Mary Hunt Bird several years ago did a research project on that and it became an assessment. Um, and you know, we are often lacking in formal assessments in the area of augmentative and alternative communication. You know, there are informal things, there are, there are assessment forms that we can get from companies. We spent a year, I think two years ago, talking about all different kinds of assessments from the communication matrix to other um, assessments, the pragmatic profile and others that are out there. But this is one that really fits well with the idea of family and roles and recognizing that people who use augmentative and alternative communication, they don't, it's just not because you put a talking box in front of them that they are using it, right? What often guides them is who they're talking to and what they're talking about and where they are. And most of the AAC communicators that I know are multimodal. They use their own natural voice, they use gestures, some use more formalized sign language, they use their high tech device, they use a low tech device. I have another student that uses a spelling board. But you know, you'll see that they choose, they choose, not the partner, they choose what's the best modality to communicate with the people that they're talking to. And it may change greatly from the people that are in their lives on a full day basis. You know, for, for those of us that are, are working in schools, how our students often talk in school, which is the fourth circle, those paid workers around them versus how they talk at home may be very different. And I will often hear people say, well, if they're not going to use it at home, how will they ever learn to use their AAC system at school? Guess what? They do! Because they're using it with people who are less familiar with their natural you know, ways in which they communicate. So it doesn't make it wrong, and it doesn't mean that we hold out just because people at home aren't using something. Um, because at school, we have different ways of communicating. And at home, people have different ways of communicating. So social networks is one of those tools that can really validate how individuals communicate with different people who are in different roles. You know, and I often will talk with families, you might understand them, but what about the unfamiliar people? Like, what about when you're at the mall? What about when you're at you know, Pizza Palace or wherever you might be at. For one of my kindergartners, um, it was when she started going to brownies and Girl Scouts. And so she wanted, she was going to the local brownies and, and Girl Scouts groups, none of whom were in her class at school. And so they didn't, people were very, very unfamiliar with her natural speaking voice. And it became a reason for her family to become more involved with her AAC system and taking it out and about the community. So, so again, go ahead, Gail. I, well, I'm curious and, and you invited us to interrupt, so I'm gonna do that. But um, I'm wondering, talk, talk to us about 
how you teach that decision making um, process, which I'm assuming is probably a a two day workshop in you know in the big picture. But but how do you help kids understand uh, which systems they should be using and how they I mean, gets to self advocacy? I think a little bit. Right. And I think that we have some speakers that are coming up that'll really talk more directly to this. But I mean, for me, it's about giving them exposure to all the different ways in which they communicate. And also when, you know, when I when I was a teacher in the classroom, one of the things I would do with my students is if people did not understand them, I would say to my students, you need you need to look. Mr. So and so is not understanding what you're saying. You need to say it a different way. So that really, I think sometimes we get into situations where we get very concerned with the AAC communicators and, and not that we shouldn't be concerned with their success, but we get overly concerned with success that we interfere with their communication. And when I'm coaching the parents that I work with, they do this a lot where they interpret for their child when they know that some, when when the parent knows that somebody hasn't understood, which takes away that opportunity from the child to see that misunderstanding. So I try to, for the people that are around my students, don't pretend, like don't pretend that you don't, un that, that you understand when you don't. They need to know the, the face of a person that's not getting it so that they can then go to another strategy that they have. This actually is gonna come up in my family story um, because we have all of these roles and we have a variety of ways in which my sister-in-law communicates with, um, with people. But that idea of people pretending to understand her natural voice did not help um, in many situations, especially when it came to personal care attendance. So that's, that leads us right into that. Um, I not only, uh, you know, I'm a special ed teacher and a consultant um, and kind of do a lot in the world of, of AAC every day, but we've also lived this as a family. So my husband's oldest sister, Kay, has cerebral palsy. Kay lived to be 72 years old. Um, she is no longer with us, but as a family, she was the oldest member in our family and she really was the family lead. Once once my husband's parents were both um, gone, she took on the lead role. However, being a woman who had been seated in a wheelchair since she was eight years old, as she got into her mid fifties and older, her breath support really did not help to sustain her speech output. And so she was need, in need of backup strategies and other ways. Um, unfortunately, we had, and this is a whole nother story, but unfortunately we were in a situation where she had a very poor AAC evaluation done where somebody did not, the person, the evaluator did not appreciate Kay's level of literacy. Um, and we went into a five year, I won't look at any of that stuff. Um, and so I was unable to show her anything that came on the market that really fulfilled her needs um, because of that a very poor interaction um, that happened that turned her off to augmentative communication. But so when you see her family around her kind of a, in the 40s and the 50s um, in the lower right hand corner um, and then that family later in the in the 2010s. But in that family are people who understand her voice. And when we, I'm gonna keep clicking here. So you'll see her um, spelling board that eventually came to be that she would use with unfamiliar partners, new members of our family, um, people in different activities. But the oldest, uh, I mean, her second oldest um, brother, when he first saw the spelling board, ripped it in half. So as a communication partner, he was insulted that, he, that somebody would give him this piece of paper with letters on it for him to understand his sister. 
And he made that very clear to all of us by ripping it in half and saying, I don't need this to talk to my sister, which started a whole <laughs> other conversation, which basically came around to Kay saying, but I need it to talk to people that haven't known me for 75 years. Right. So, you know, it was it was her making him realize that this wasn't about him as a communication partner. It was about others. We got past that bad AAC evaluation because of a caregiver, a caregiver who came into Kay's home, who did not pretend to understand her natural speaking voice. And Kay was also one of these people, one of these speakers that if you didn't understand it the first time she said it to you, she maybe would repeat it once and then she was done. Like she's not gonna sit there and repeat it. She wouldn't rephrase it. Now I you know, am colleagues with people who will rephrase, they'll try to use other words. But Kay wasn't one of those people, uh, which was all of her own choice, right? That's how she got to be the great person that she was um, and, and the personality that she was. But we all learned that if what we didn't understand, you had to look to somebody else. And for me, having been around individuals that have needed support with their communication almost all my life, um, have been people in my family and church and, and then my working life. But I only understood about 35% of what she said. And I overestimated how much I understood. I thought I, when people asked me, I would say, oh, I understand 75%. And then I just look to my husband or my other sister-in-law and they tell me. But I sat down one holiday and did a little data sheet um, that uh, Barry Romick was actually asking me about it and from the Pranky Romick company. And so I did a tally and I came out of that very shocked at how much I as a communication partner didn't understand. So I use that as a strategy now with some of my family members or teachers or para pros that say, oh, I understand everything she says. Okay, take this little 20 minute block of time and just write down every time you understand, do a hash mark, every time you don't, every time you, at, you look to somebody else's interpretation. And that becomes quite as it was for me, a jumping off point to what do we have to do next? And so in our lives as a family, the next step with this individual who had come into Kay's life as a caregiver was that she made an alphabet board. Now she was, you know, a typical in-home caregiver who doesn't have a lot of background in all of this and basically took a stencil on a big old piece of cardboard from Walmart and made her a spelling board on the shiny side of the cardboard, which, you know, the big poster board, which meant that as soon as she moved her hand across it, the whole thing smeared. So she came to Thanksgiving to our, our house that year with this huge alphabet board, like as big as this one behind me, all alphabet board, jewel tone colors. Um, and I was like, oh, we can do this better. And so then that became my opening to say, here are all the other things that other people use. And so I was able to, sh to send her home and my other sister-in-law with her who lived close to her, who they were very tight communication partners, home with examples, you know, pulled right off the internet, so that they could see what this could be. And after about a month we met, and then the board that you see here on this um, um, image in the top middle is what was the result of she and I sitting down with board maker together and creating it. Her first board was just this alphabet with a couple um, command in the bottom row. And then the sister-in-law that you see at the bottom of the screen, along with Kay, Judy one day announced if she spells the word T-H-E one more time, I am going to scream. But literacy was very important to Kay. You understanding that she was a highly literate person, that she was not going to talk in just keywords, 
right? She was going to add every article, connector word, all of those, those pieces um, into it. And so we had to find a compromise between two family members of, is it just going to be the alphabet or can we put some common words on your board? Unfortunately, because of the time um, that, that Kay was alive and the things that were and weren't developed yet to make accommodations on iPads and things like timing, um, she really did not successfully ever use electronic systems, but she didn't really like them either. Like she abandoned her computer that she bought because she, she much preferred to type on a typewriter, um, which was a part of her world, you know, in the volunteer work that she did and the church work that she did. So you'll, you know, you'll find many things so that low tech it can be quite vital. It's not always that everything has to be high tech. You are not a loser of an S of an AAC, you know, communication partner if you don't get everybody to high tech, right? Sometimes that bell <laughs> was what she needed to get a person's attention because she would, you know, try other strategies and she would use her voice and people in her home, you know, if they were in the kitchen and she's in her bedroom, they didn't always hear her. So, you know, those kinds of low tech things really helped with her autonomy and her independence. And I would say, you know, as we, we came to the end of, of Kay's life, it really was important, very critical to make sure that the people that were coming into our lives understood her communication system. So communication partner roles for all, almost all of us changed. We have a chaplain who's in our, our family who hadn't been involved very much with her um, at that point, but really learned how to take their time and the kinds of things that she wanted to discuss. We had people from hospice care that needed to learn, you know, communication strategies with her. And when she could no longer use her fingers to point, we had to, to teach the strategy of partner assisted scanning, um, which the first thing she typed out partner assisted scanning was, did you invent this? <laughs> like, like, no, <laughs> but you never know what's on somebody's mind. But, you know, it, and I think that we learn as partners when to push and when not to push. Um, and that we are always teaching and advocating. You know, we would be in situations in hospitals where hospital nursing staff and respiratory therapists and the cardiac specialist had never communicated with somebody that used AAC before. And many of my students are medically fragile. So um, we're talk about what is that medical vocabulary and how are they preparing? And I have parents that prepare their children to talk to the doctor when they go to the Rett syndrome clinic or whatever they might specialty that they might be going to. So that that doctor or that specialist hears their voice, not just the parent talking for them. And for some of my families, that was a, a slow lead up to, and other people were asking me, how do we do this? And for me, I was able to, to go back to our time that we would do, you know, and how, how we would help Kate speak to nurses and unfamiliar partners. So it, you know, it, that role doesn't always stay just as speech therapist. It doesn't always stay just as sister-in-law. It doesn't always just stay as teacher. A lot of it depends upon where you are in the chain of knowing this person's communication system compared to the other people that are in that room with you. So I don't know if people want to share their stories or perspectives or questions that you have on that. Um, one of the things I've learned in all of this is that People's beliefs, like my brother-in-law who ripped it in half and my sister-in-law who said, I can't have every word spelled out loud to me, but people's beliefs are changed by their experience. 
And I think that too often in AAC, we think, oh, I'm just going to bring the device in, or I'm going to show you some video that somebody else did. And that's going to make all the difference um, to the consumer and their family or whoever, or to the teacher and the parapro. But what we really need to do is to dig in and change their current experience. And that slowly impacts their beliefs and how they value AAC systems. So with that, I'll be quiet and let Gail pull up anything from the chat or have you all, what are you thinking about all of this? You know, the chat's been very quiet, but I know uh, certainly for me, you stimulated a lot of ideas. I want to um, invite other people to uh, to share your stories, your aha moments about communication partners. And thank you, Kelly, for sharing that family story. It's a big thing that influences all the work that I do now. I mean, it's, you know, since that time, which is now almost eight years ago, um, wow. it really shapes how I work with families and, and chat with paraprofessionals. I was a paraprofessional. So that also, I got started in all of this as a parapro, as a counselor at camps, and then a parapro, and then a teacher. Um, and so when I'm working in classrooms, I spend a lot of time with the caregiver and and the para pros because those are the people that are often, you know, that direct communicator and or communication facilitator um, for an AAC user. You know, you reminded me of a, a story similar to the one that you you told about the brother your brother-in-law ripping up the communication board. When I was when I was a classroom teacher, um, we worked very hard with our um, Oregon Health Sciences University, our our hospital clinic, to get a an augmented communication device for one of our students, and we really picked out a good one for him. I think I know he used it for years and years, but um, he he and his mom had been to Portland and done all those clinical things. And we really, we thought we were doing it perfectly right. But the day, uh, and, and he came back to school with with the device and um, we practiced at school for a long time. And then um, everybody agreed it was time for him to take it home. And the day he went home with his new electronic device, he rolled his wheelchair into the living room and said something like, hi, dad, how was your day? And his father looked at him and said, I will not talk to a machine. I want to talk to my son. And, you know, so we had this sudden aha moment about how important it was to include all family members in the, not only in the use of the device as communication partners, but in the decision-making process. And his dad never did talk to Matt using the outcome device, although Matt was really good at using it. Uh, it particularly, I, I love the social networks idea, you know, with unfamiliar listeners and, and uh, unfamiliar communication partners. Um, and, and, you know, he, he ended up with a with a job at the local school district and he used it all the time, but never at home with his dad. It is it, that belief, I'm just going to go back, the, the belief piece and how people identify themselves or identify the situation is, the, is a really critical component that I don't think that everybody thinks about, right? I think that they think, oh, well, we've gotten this device. This is great. Look how hard we all worked. And it should just start to flow. And it and when it doesn't, people are surprised. Um, and, and knowing what people's beliefs are. I had a family that I worked with in early intervention that my, uh, my SLP and I would go into his home until he started going to kindergarten. And, um, and then we supported the school. But his father and still i mean he's a young man now in his 30s i i have a, i have a kindergartner that that facebook friended me and he's 40 so that that'll give you a little bit of 
of age <laughs> on me, right? Like that was a big shocker. Like, oh, okay, you're 40, great, yay. Um, <laughs> I'm still 28. Um, but uh, but I had, you know, this the father in the family where the mother was had done all the things like like you had said, yeah, they had gone to a clinic, they had spent a lot of time with AAC specialists, made some decisions. But the father truly believed um, that at some point an implant would happen in his son's head that would directly go from his thoughts to a voice. And, you know, and that was 1989, right? Mm -hmm. And and still, I mean, and that young man uses a communication system, moves through, he's a journalist, you know, he does a lot to communicate, but his father is still waiting for that day. Yeah, it's beliefs are, are uh, you know, and, and unspoken beliefs are a very hard component. Um, and belief systems aren't just in others, right? Like you've got to look at your own. In case situation with hospice, when she was having a difficult time spelling, and it wasn't just when she couldn't point anymore because we'd already gotten past that part where... I always have her board here uh, where she couldn't point. And so we taught her to do the partner scanning, but um, she kept doing the same three letters over and over again. And my other sister-in-law and my husband and I are like, we do not know what she's trying to spell. And she just kept doing the same three letters over and over again. And the hospice care worker who did not know about AAC, except for what she'd experienced the last couple of weeks with her, said, Aren't, weren't you ready for when she couldn't spell? And I about fell off the couch. I was like, no. Like, I was, I was not prepared for that moment that she would lose. I mean, literacy was such a huge, she, you know, was such a huge factor for her. She, you know, beat us by 20,000 points in Scrabble. I mean, it was crazy, right? Um, but we, I wasn't ready for that. And I was, I was ready, like, oh my gosh, if I can't serve my own family, I mean, and you can talk to some of my colleagues that I worked with at Bridge Camp that summer. I was ready to close my practice. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. If I, if I couldn't look ahead this far for my own family member, what am I doing serving other people? Like, I was closing up shop and turning things over to Scott Marfilius and and others. <laughs> so Kelly there, um, Alyssa um, typed quite a, a, a fairly long thing in the chat. And I'm wondering, Alyssa, would you be willing to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit more about you said what you said? She said she's new to her district and uh, trying to approach this in maybe a little bit different way. Can you unmute yourself? and? Talk to us about what you're thinking. Yeah, hello. Thank you. Um, I have been with my district for, this is my eighth year now, um, but previous seven as an SLP in a school. Um, and this is the first year that I am taking over a district position as the AAC coach. Um, and so I am trying to get a base level understanding across all of our schools from early childhood to transition. Um, we have many schools and just trying to get um, those who work with our complex communicators to understand the basics of partner strategies and um, the understanding that a lot of our students don't come in with reliable language and just starting, starting there. Um, and also, you know, listening to your, your chat today, Ms. Bonner, that uh, families isn't something we always have access to. And so also thinking about how, you know, I'm starting with paraprofessionals and staff because those are our students that are, they're working with our students every day. But then also thinking about how can I support our teams at the schools to either create some sort of family reach out or is that my role as a district coordinator? <laughs> um, should I be making some sort of family support? But knowing that the SLPs at the schools probably already have relationships with the families, but knowing that their plates are really full. Um, so those are just things that are kind of swirling around in my head as you know, month one of this new role. <laughs> well, welcome to it, Alyssa. Thank you. And they I'm are really very excited. lucky to to have put that put you in in that type of 
position. Thank you. Um, I'm loving it so far. I'm really, really happy. Oh, good. That. Yeah. It's a, it's a popular thing that's happening now where people in districts are looking at what's our district wide approach. And in fact, last, I think the last session in Echo Voices last year with Irene Hughes talked about from Evergreen School, yes. right? Evergreen. So she yeah. talked about that and, and we've, we've turned it into a pre-conference at, um, yes. at closing the gap this yes. year with, yes. with Yes, she is my predecessor. Her retirement date was Friday. So I'm on wow. week one of being solo here. <laughs> wow. So yes, yeah, so that idea of what are we doing across districts so that there is a baseline because I think, you know, when we use that expert model of going in to assess kids for what they should be using AAC wise, if, if our students don't have any experience prior to that assessment, how can they show the assessor right. what it is that they know um, and what they can do? And um, and so I think that that those are you know great steps to, to go for it and to, to move forward with, right? Is is what are we doing, approaching it from how do people know how to communicate and not put all of the focus on the stuff. Like so many people, as soon as they AC come up, the focus is on the stuff mm -hmm. and not realizing that the make and break it is really the people piece. Yeah. Right? Well, I'm looking forward to the rest of these uh, um, sessions to, to hear what everyone else is, the experts. Yeah, the it's Matt and Jill one is very timely for you because right. that even though it, it, the title in the title of their session it says focus towards family, but their strategies are are para pro very para pro friendly. Great. Created there first. Perfect. You know, I want to raise a question about para pros. One of the things we're hearing from um, lots of schools in Oregon and certainly around the country is that we that because we're so short of staff right now, we're seeing parapros um, get placed in a classroom, start to work with kids with complex needs, and then uh, be moved to a different environment. So the, the turnover of, um, mm -hmm. of parapros in classrooms is enormous in many places. And, if you know, if I were in charge of the world for those kids with really complex needs, I'd I'd keep those pair pros as consistent as possible and make sure there were, you know, at least two people in every classroom who knew how to do that stuff. But since I'm not in charge of the world, one of one of the things I'm curious about is how all of you are dealing with that turnover in terms of. The, the kinds of communication partner strategies that you're trying to teach. Alyssa, you mentioned um, a real focus on pair pros too. And I, I don't know, maybe too early in the year to, to have to had that experience, or, or maybe I could be in charge of your district. <laughs> maybe your district is one that keeps people consistent. But I'm wondering just as a as a topic, how are you dealing with that enormous turnover when we're trying to train partners? Yeah, one of the districts that I consulted to on purpose move parapros around. Oh, interesting. And so they started this, oh, this has to be 10 years ago, they started this process that parapros got rotated every two weeks. And it wasn't just parapros in classrooms. They got rotated in on the recess duty parapros, the library paraprofessionals, the kitchen paraprofessionals, everybody in the school at that high school, they started it at the high school level, got rotated around. And of course, the first probably two months of the first year, people were like, oh, this is never going to work. <laughs> but then what they found is that because people were getting within, you know, the first two months, they were getting diff four different experiences that their retention went up. Really? They had, yes. They had less people leaving because it wasn't the same job all the time. Now they did have people that really wanted to specialize and, and, some of the things they did in the in the first couple of years was move them to a school that wasn't doing this rotating pattern. 
So, okay, you like being the library paraprofessional, we'll move you to another school in that role. Um, but they found that once everybody got used to it, they really liked it. Um, and when there was somebody that was out sick, they immediately had somebody that they could grab from another part of the school um, to be a student. Now this was not, they did not rotate one-on-one -on -one aides. So if children were assigned a one-on-one -on -one through the IEP team, that person didn't rotate, but their pool of people that could fill that job grew. And like I said, they did that on purpose. That was like pre-COVID, you know, pre-major shortages was something done on purpose. Interesting. Even if you didn't have the ability to do that for a whole school, it seems like you could do it within a within a class within a program or within a classroom and make because yeah. we've talked a lot about cross training. Right. Uh, making sure that there were at least, as I said, at least two people who had the knowledge and skills of how to, to help kids, particularly with complex needs. You know, and having been a one on one para pro for a kid with significant needs across the board, medical, physical, communication, academic, it's a hard, I mean, it's a hard day. You, you, I mean, you get very little breaks. And so I know as I, um, as I work with my families that have been requesting this, you know, we, they want their own one-on-one -on -one communication. I'm telling them, ask for two. Don't, you know, get a morning, per get a morning person and get an afternoon person. Don't have it be just one person all the time because that person exhausts. And then that person also starts, it, it happens naturally, it takes over. And teachers look to that person to really be the teacher of the kid, not, you know, it, it starts to interfere with the direct line of communication with a student and their teachers when there is a full time one on one. So I'm always advocating for have two people um, that change so that if somebody is sick, then that person can cover for a whole day and you're, you're, and you're good to go that way. Kelly, there's a, a, another comment in the chat. Vicki Bernard um, was, is talking about two high school students that she works with who rarely use their devices. Vicki, would you be willing to unmute yourself and, and talk to us a little bit more about that situation? Sure. Um, these are two very capable um, students, two different high schools. Um, and, but they've had kind of what, um, Kelly was just talking about the same assistant with them forever and ever. And those assistants feel that they understand everything they say. And I, I don't know, I think it happens at home as well with these two, because they are verbal. Um, they do speak, but, um, I know I probably understand because I don't see them that often, maybe 10% of what they say. And I have to say, would you please bring out your device? Because a lot of times they're not even carrying it. And so, you know, even though they have a place on their chair for it, they're not carrying it. And because it gets in the way is what I hear from the staff. And, and the other thing I think the staff they don't want to wait because these boys are both, they're very similar, um, but two different high schools, two different um, districts. And they, they are both very physically involved. So it takes them a long time to access um, even phrases that they have on their device, common phrases that they use. And so people don't want to wait. And they just say, well, I understand what they're saying. And so I, I liked your idea of taking the data on the understanding um, to actually demonstrate to them, okay, this is what um, you actually understand, but I, I'm not sure how to implement that um, and get them 
bought into even trying it. Do you yes, have any some, ideas? <laughs> okay, well, Vicki, I think some of it is exploring like that often pair pros, their identity, right, is based upon the success of the kid that they're with. Mm -hmm. And so they do everything they can to help that happen, success happen, right? So, which means talking for them, making things go faster, making sure tasks get done. And it's working towards that as uh, because right now their belief often is that's what their role is, make this successful. They don't always think about their identity being helping them for the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like what's going to happen when you are no longer the pusher of the chair? Um, and so I've, I've gotten the, the best um, reality check for parapros by going to um, and having speakers who are AAC communicators um, that the uh, USAC has, USAC, the United States Society for AAC has mm -hmm. a speakers bureau now that you can look for speakers. And, and many of them are speakers, you know, that are funded in different ways. Um, Krista Howard's a good example, you know, very much in talk about empowerment. With one of my students, we have um, a person that uses an AAC system consulting on her case, and she um, observes each of the interactions with the different teachers and then gives that teacher feedback. Um, and so when it, I found when it comes from somebody who's lived the life right, who's lived that life of your high schoolers, it's much more meaningful to parapros um, when it comes from somebody who's actually in that spot than another thing that professionals are telling them how to do their job, right? The, mm -hmm. the data collection piece was helpful for me also as a resource teacher when I had a parapro that was a scribe. Um, who would add to the answers of one of my students, but didn't know that she was always doing it until the science teacher questioned whose work was it. Um, mm -hmm. And when we videoed it and she, and I just gave her the video to watch herself, she heard all the cueing that she was giving this girl, Nicole, for the answers on the questions. Is it one, two, or three? Like, I mean, it was sometimes that obvious. And I honestly, all I had to do was say, you know, Mr. So-and-so, the science teacher is questioning whether or not this really is Nicole's work. So I'm going to be recording the sessions to give to him. So I kind of put all of the, <laughs> as the resource teacher, like I put all of the blame on Mr. So-and-so, but, you know, I said, so we really want him to know that this is her work. And then I went, once we did it, I said, I think we need to listen to this because he might have a point <laughs> and let, and she, like I said, she kind of fixed it herself, but that, that part helped that, yeah. work, that reality, that changing the experience of the reality um, really helped without me having to say, you can't do this and you do this and, and that piece of it. So, so oh, go ahead, Vicki. Oh, I was going to ask, I like what you said about recording what what's happening, but um, how these these kids um, these young men are um, like I said both in regular classrooms. I'm not sure if that's right. happening with them. I don't know if they use a scribe, but do you have like maybe a series of questions that just to kind of screen how the understanding, you know, the data on the understanding, do you have like a series of questions that you might use to bring out, you know, the, the um, okay. <laughs> right, there's your thing. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. done, it's research-based. You know, there, the, um, there's also, <laughs> a training video that goes along with this where um, consumers and family members and people around that consumer also speak to how communication happens at these different levels. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that 
that you know having somebody who's an augmented user i spoke to it from this the point of the pair pro but having them meet with your students is can be very empowering because they could ask whatever questions you I mean we not we don't know what they're all thinking about you know what mm -hmm. do you think about these people talking for you you know it does that ever right. does that ever tick you off like right I, I once heard a speech from a 16 year old that was so valuable because he talked about his assistive technology pyramid and at the very top of his pyramid was the messages that were pre-programmed into his device for caregivers on how to do things for him you know he was tired of being just kind of handled um in all the physical ways that some of our our individuals who have a lot of physical challenges get handled right my sister-in-law was the same way she's like you're going to put my sweater on this way or i'm going to be in hours of pain um and this young man really explained how that was the most valuable part of him using his AAC system was to direct care of others. And then slowly other, you know, then he got tired of people talking for him and he reached that, that point of I, I've had it. Some people aren't at that point yet until maybe they hear it from another communicator. Like how, if they don't even know they might have the right to be upset that other people are talking for them. Right, that might right. not even be something that they've thought of. Uh, my guess is with these two that that's probably the case because at least with one of them, I've known one of them for quite a while, and his um, para, his EA, has moved up with him from elementary school through middle school through high school, and um, she does a lot of that. I, you know, I heard her do it in the classroom. Um, I'm actually not even working on ACAT in that district, either district. I'm doing feeding with these two boys. And, you know, but I see, uh, you know, because I wear both hats, I see, you know, what's happening with the A, the AAC or what's not happening with right. the AAC. And um, so, it would be yeah so i'm definitely going to look into that um the book because it looks to, the other thing to look at is and i've done this with middle school and high schoolers is when if they've got a part of their curriculum human rights in it, like a part of their civics class or anything and then we give the information on the communication bill of rights right we do that piece um and give that information oh, it's on one of these slides <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm a, um, yeah, I know what but it we is. give we, that to the teacher, mm -hmm. to the civics teacher, to the social studies teacher, and they can include that as a part of their human rights curriculum. Cool, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, I'm in both of these districts, there is somebody else that's designated as the, um, the speech path that follows through on the AAC devices. And, and so I know one of them in one of the districts. Um, so she'll be easy to talk with, but the uh, I don't even know who's doing it in the other district. So if anybody's doing it anymore, um, or if he's just been kind of put out on his own, oh, you can do it now. And, um, but <laughs> so, so lots of good ideas. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm definitely going to look into getting that um, that thing from the book from attainment. So thank you. Social networks, you got it. Yeah. Well, Gail, I know that we're we're coming up to the end. We are we very to close. To <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that you knew in the handout, everyone, that I pulled three different sets of communication tips, um, tips from the family network on families communicating with professionals that like keeping records. And so, you know, I'm often in that role of, of coaching families, you know, what are the things to do, you know, those, those pieces of it all. Um, 
also looking at, you know, the other side of, of professionals talking with families. So you've got some, you know, some good examples there and more information if you go to the Family Network um, to their website. I'll make sure I put the website in as well. For AAC communicators, there used to be a wonderful publication out of Pittsburgh called Hear Our Voices. It doesn't exist anymore, but I'm constantly pulling stuff from it. Um, where they you know, gave ideas for their, their 10 commandments for families um, and working with those of us that are in their uh, professional role um, to make sure, you know, a lot of things in writing kind of follow some of the quiet indicators, making sure that there are things in writing, right? Um, and those pieces. And I know that my family members who have taken advocates with them or having been a part of an advocacy group or that that's been big help um, to them in their situation. And then from the student's point of view, we have a wonderful member in our, our family group who is also a, a woman with, um, that was born with a disability. And she has this poster that talks about how children and families relate to one another. Um, and that, you know, where there's so much guilt and there's so many we should ofs and and ifs that I think that those of us that aren't in that position as a family member need to recognize all those things that are happening underlying. Um, and I think that Sally's words, as she would say to her parents, um, you know, that it doesn't all have to happen right now, right? Like you can stick up for me, but you don't have to do it for the whole world, right? So a lot of these things I just help to with people and, and sometimes calming some situations, you know, not every situation goes, goes that, that way, but, but I, hopefully some of these can be some final words um, for you. And I'm going to turn it back to Gail to, to close us up with this last reminder of go back to some of the ones we've talked about. Well, thank you, uh, Kelly. I, I'm not, I think you just did a wonderful job of closing it up um you should you have links in the chat for um all of the different kinds of links that we talked about today and also for the handouts um if you don't know it you can actually save the chat on your own computer by going to those three little dots down in the chat box and it'll give you the option to save the chat which i do every time there's that many links in a in a chat. I want to thank you all for a great kickoff to uh, Echo Voices and to the uh, work that we'll be doing together this year, talking about how to be good communication partners, um, both as users of augmentative communication and as the, uh, as the people who um, want to facilitate the use of augmentative communication. We're um, thrilled to have you and we wish you a very good year. Please keep in touch. Um, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>